Good evening. It's so nice to see you t this evening. I'm Denise Simmons, and you may know me as a former mayor. You may know me as a city council. You may know me as a longtime Cambridge resident or general busybody. But today I'm here with two extraordinary individuals to talk about our community, community of Cambridge, and the indigenous culture. Do or does indigenous people's lives matter? And what does that mean? We're going to talk about reparations. We're going to talk about just the history of what has happened in our country, but particularly in this place called Cambridge, formerly called Newtown, and Sage is gonna help me with the, its actual real indigenous name. Now, how did this all start? I was pleased to have an opportunity to meet Professor Shane Lowry uh, through a conversation on something totally unrelated to history. And in, in and during that conversation, I found out that his background and I was just ecstatic because it was something that I was thinking about in our work around the Cambridge Museum of History and Culture. And although you can't see them, I'm pleased to have a couple of the advisory members here, Marty Blatt and Ed Rodley, as we have this conversation and dig deep into this subject. So as I said, the, this, this work is part of what the Cambridge Museum has been doing. We've had a number of wonderful programs. We had a program on the LGBT history. We literally had a wonderful sort of fireside chat, we'll call this a plant side chat, uh, around with a number of the leaders of the LGBTQ community not too long ago, which was extraordinary. We've had a conversation around aging and aging in place. We've had two history strolls. Uh, one again around the LGBT plus community and one about the black around the black community and I'm pleased to say in February 2023 we'll have another conversation extending that conversation around the black community focusing on black entrepreneurship and uh, black leadership so I hope that you'll stay tuned and seek us out at Cambridge the Cambridge Museum website to find out when that's going to be happening but specifically about today. As many of you know, this is October, and the earlier part of the month, the city council even acknowledged that not only was this October, but formerly called Columbus Day has now been called Indigenous People Day. This is very important. It's important for me personally, and I think for the city as a whole, to recognize and tell the story of who we really are, but also who we want to be and how do we get there? So I, I had a conversation with Professor Lowry on a subject totally unrelated, and we started talking about this. And I said, well, gee, we're doing the Cambridge Museum of History and Culture, we're doing these conversations, we have these exhibits, would you be willing to be part of it? And he gladly said, yes, he would. But he said, it's not just my conversation. Let's bring some other voices in. And he introduced me to Sage Carbone, who's with us. And I am ecstatic. And I think you will, too, as we have a conversation about indigenous people, indigenous culture, their place. How do we get our communities from the margins and into the center of the page? So let's get started. I'm going to allow them, because I could do a poor job of introducing them, to tell them a little bit about themselves. You know, what is your background? Why do you do the work that you do around indigenous people and indigenous culture? Uh, and we'll go further along as we go through the program to talk about what are some of the remedies. But who would like to start off? I'll start. Great. So, hi everybody. Um, thank you, Denise, for having me today. Uh, my name is Sage Carbone. I am a member of the Northern Narragansett Tribe of Rhode Island. Um, I have uh, Nipmuc, Mohegan, and Abenaki ancestry. And so my existence is resistance. Um, I am very thankful to be here um, representing, to the best of my abilities, some of the um, Eastern uh, woodland tribes uh, that have traditionally called um, this area home and also uh, continue to do so. so thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> I'd like, like Sage, I'd like to thank you for inviting us here. Um, I'm David Shane Lowry. Uh, Shane is my middle name. Uh, a lot of people prefer it to David, but I go by my full name. Um, Currently, I'm a senior fellow in the School of Social Policy at Brandeis University. Uh, this past year, I was Distinguished Fellow in Native American Studies at MIT. Um, I'm from the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina, which means a lot to 
to a lot of people and not a lot to other people. And I say it that way because when you know our community, we're large. We're the largest American Indian community east of the Mississippi River. Um, tens of thousands of people in the, our tribal community. But when you ask about our significance on the national stage, well, we're disappeared in many ways. We're not as famous as the Cherokee or the Navajo and other tribes. But um, yeah, I wanna thank you for bringing us here because I think this conversation is important. My role at MIT this past year, or my role at MIT this past year was not uh, the end all be all of the conversation I was having around Cambridge and Boston and Massachusetts. So yeah, it's good to return to this kind of collective um, paradigm shifting conversation. I want to thank both of you for being here. You know, most of us know, those that study history, study a little bit about the city of Cambridge, we know that, well, it was founded, although, as I often would tell my children, it wasn't lost, uh, around the 1600s. And what I'd like to do is let's start around the 1600s. And can you, can you from your perspective, uh, tell us a little about the history of the land right now. And you were, I have to thank you over and over again, Sage, for giving me the correct name of Cambridge called, now Cambridge, formerly Newtown, and, but its indigenous name was? And Mocha again. Thank you. There'll be a test. Tell us a little bit about the history as you see it and know it, and then we're going to come to you. And, and this doesn't have to be neat, but let's have a conversation. Uh, let's really engage. So, you know, mm -hmm. I want you to feel comfortable just kind of talking at leisure, if you will. But yeah. let's, let's hear a little bit about the history. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the first thing that um, people living in Cambridge and really everybody that is you know, in the United States needs to understand is that where you are today, it mm -hmm. looked very different in the 1600s, it looked very different in the 1800s, and you know, people talk about industrialization or gentrification of the last few decades. Um, but when we look at the history of where a, a place is and who is there and what it means to be a Cantabrigian and to be on these lands, um, there needs to be an acknowledgement that it didn't always look this way. Mm -hmm. Um, as an example, uh, there was a wigwam settlement on what is now Putnam Avenue and right across uh, the street pretty much from our studios where we are here today at CCTV is Lafayette Square um, where there were marketplaces for different oysters and shellfish that were used from tribes all over these places. And that's because it wasn't always solid land here. Um, in fact, the Charles River um, looks very different from when it had, um, when Cambridge was founded. Um, since then, there have been over 30 dams put in. Mm. Um, and the Shawmut Peninsula, which is the area of water kind of between Boston and Charlestown and Cambridge, um, you know, that had been a really significant space for fishing. Um, seasonally for tribes that extended all the way down um, to Rhode Island and Connecticut, um, the Mohawk tribe of uh, Long Island, and then all the way up through um, the Roostic bands in Maine. Um, and you actually see some of the same language mm -hmm. and words for um, these places. So the um, Massachusetts name for Cambridge and, Mo and Mokujan is also the same place uh, name of an area in Maine as well. Wow, mm -hmm. I, and I didn't know that. So you learn a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, you know, this is really about not only telling history, but it's really learning, learning that we walk in the path of those that were already here, mm -hmm. what that meant to be here, what it looked like. So just to hear there was a, a, a wigwam on Putman Avenue, and I go up and down Putman Avenue all the time. And the kind of, you know, just to jump around a little bit, you were very successful just recently, Sage, and it kept bringing something to bear when it comes about naming and claiming. Can you share that with us a little bit? I did, thank you. Because I'm excited you. about this. Thank you, Denise, yes. Um, so last year, I put forward a um, proposal in the participatory budgeting process, um, the city of Cambridge, and, um, to add indigenous language onto city signage. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really, um, I was inspired after going to the um, Skemetsen uh, Festival of uh, Corn and Grass Dance, uh, Corn and Dance, mm -hmm. um, down at the Mashantucket Pequot um, Reservation. Mm -hmm. And you would be able to see 
signs like a stop sign or numbered streets in the Mohegan languages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was just so nice and you could hear it being spoken and I think it was something that really, you know, I would like to see in my strolls, you know, as a Cambridge resident. And I think that's really excellent. And so for those of you that may not know what participatory budgeting is, participatory budgeting, I think we've been doing it about four or five years now, is a process whereby the city sets aside a uh, amount of money. I think we're up to a million dollars now. And people come together to decide what kinds of things they would like to see funded. And then they put a list together and that list is circulated through the entire city and people get to vote on what they would like to see done. And your petition to have the city's streets names or locations named after their original indigenous marker or place mm -hmm. is now going to happen. And I was pleased to talk to Charles Sullivan from the Historical uh, Commission and they're beginning to work on that. So at some point you're going to be able to drive over to the Charles River Bridge mm -hmm. or maybe it'll actually have the, its actual name, but it's, instead of saying entering Cambridge, it's going to say entering. And Moke again. <laughs> Thank you. And I think that's important. You know, I, I spend a lot of time with my, my grandchildren and I like to remind them about the history in their midst and I'm hoping mm -hmm. Sage and, and Professor Lowry that this will grow. It won't just stop mm -hmm. with the naming of the street. But Professor Lowry, let's let's, let's have you join the conversation. You know, you, first, Professor Lowry, I actually enjoy. He's such a fire starter, uh, but not in the way of burning things down, but lighting things up, mm -hmm. adding light onto things that we should not be ignoring. And so some of the work that even got us to this day was to talk mm -hmm. about you know, what ways that you believe in particular the city of Cambridge could bring visibility to the indigenous population. But before we do that, is there anything more you would like to add to the history of Cambridge? Or we can move right to the next question about what can Cambridge be doing? Yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, I like to be called a fire starter in many ways because uh, somebody actually at MIT, I think it was uh, Debbie Douglas who leads the MIT Museum, she says that I set Roman candles off in people's brains or minds. <laughs> which I, I thought that was appropriate too. Mm -hmm. um, in many ways, um, there's a sense of colonialism does something, it doles your senses, not just your memory, but the way you interact with everything, the way you taste food, the way you have relationships, the way you sleep, um, the way that you do leisurely things. Colonialism affects everything. So what I like to point out following Sage's brilliant sort of overview of, of this region is that Cambridge and Boston is central ground zero for doing this type of work. Work to rename, to reclaim, to provide reparations for indigenous people. Because if you go from Maine all the way down to, let's say, Connecticut, Rhode Island, uh, out to the western part of New York, a lot of people were brought in who were indigenous prisoners, who were indigenous, were brought in along trails, along highways, into Cambridge, into Boston, to the State House in, in, in Boston and they were put on trial. And then, you know, the, the trial wasn't fair by any stretch of the imagination. And a lot of them were sentenced to death. They were sentenced to enslavement. So beginning in, I would say, 1640s, 1650s, uh, especially up until, it, it really starts around 1675 when we have the Indian Imprisonment Act, I believe is the name of the, the act. Um, in 1675, you literally have American Indian people, indigenous folks from this region, outlawed from the city of Boston, and I would argue was probably quasi outlawed from the city of Cambridge, um, as uh, unless they were accompanied by non-indigenous, usually white male folk. Um, and I think that's really important because all these people brought down trails, led to the, the state house where they were given trials, which is basically the colony telling indigenous people that they were subhuman and they needed to be sent into slavery or into death. And, and so this area right here is not this kind of utopia of liberal sort of intellectual sort of engagement. This is really the, the central space and central place where indigenous people, uh, where the colony in the United States learn, the colonizers in the United States learn to mistreat and, and in terms of policy put indigenous people out of sight and out of mind. Mm -hmm. This logic from about 1660, 1670 going forward was spread across the United States. It was spread down south. Uh, we saw Andrew Jackson quoting legislatures from up here in the Northeast when he did his work, uh, which led to the Trail of Tears. You see it spread in the, uh, in the midst of the Civil War and past the Civil War into the West where MIT's third president, Francis Walker, 
uh, led, while he was president of MIT, he led conversations across the United States about how to get governments and universities to keep American Indian indigenous people from reclaiming the land that was stolen from them to create those governments and those universities. So following stage again, this is a critical, critical space, political space, political kind of um, entity, Cambridge and Boston, to begin these conversations. So I'm, I'm glad that um, you're having them. And the second question was what again? What, do, what could Cambridge, you know, Cambridge is the bastion of liberalism and progressive move, movement mm -hmm. and thought. What could we, should we, what do we need to be doing when you think about how do we take in the indigenous population, very similar to the African American or the African population, mm -hmm. but how do we bring that community, again, from them, undisappear them, I think that's the best word. How do we undisappear yeah. the indigenous population? What could Cambridge do or what should it be doing? Yeah, this area, and I think Lexington, Lexington which is just kind of North of here, uh, they have the most Nobel Prize winners per capita, I think, of any place in the United States. But we're their neighbor. So this area, Cambridge, Boston, Cambridge in particular has a lot of the most, um, let, shall we say, most awarded scholars, intellectuals, uh, Americans. And so as I'm looking at our community here in Cambridge, I'm, I'm seeing that, that the work that we do to bring indigenous people, American Indian people, Native American people to the fore mm -hmm. isn't just about doing it locally, we literally have our students in the state of Massachusetts across the nation reading the Declaration of Independence, mm -hmm. which still to this day unapologetically calls American Indian, Native American, American uh, indigenous people merciless Indian savages. It says it without apology and the people who claim that it's our founding document of the United States do it as if it should be done without apology. So the brilliant coll collectivity of folks here in, in Cambridge and, and across Massachusetts and across the United States should work together, should work given their stature intellectually and, and politically to begin to correct how indigenous people in policy, in our founding documents, are labeled as if we don't exist already. Mm -hmm. And if we do exist, that we shouldn't exist, that we are somehow subhuman or, or people who are animalistic. Um, and, and I think that's where the conversation goes. Here in Cambridge, yes, it begins locally by redefining how we teach our students in public and private schools. Um, pressing, and I, I believe we'll get to this conversation later, pressing Harvard University and other institutions locally who possess our indigenous relatives in museums to release them and humanize them and give them proper burials. That type of pressure can't be done by me or, or Sage or anybody individually. It has to be done collectively as a political, um, shall we say, collectivity. I, I really appreciate you saying that and, and sort of igniting that spark in our brains because we kind of know it, but we don't always act it or do it. Mm -hmm. and, and these conversations, this one I hope will light a fire, not only on what we hear, but what we think and then what we do. And we talk about what we do. How do we, and I ask both of you, and I'll start with you, Sage, how do we empower indigenous voices? How do we act so? It's one thing to talk about, but, but how do we act so? What kinds of things should we think about trying to do and then implement? I mean, well, indigenous people are doing it. You know, the, the, we are doing the hard work whether or not we have the structural, political, social, um, you know, means and resources to be successful uh, is a whole nother, you know, com it's a whole different part of the conversation. And we talk about, you know, invigorating money into these causes. However, um, you know, from my experiences, mm -hmm. uh, working uh, as a former employee with the city of Cambridge and then mm -hmm. also as a resident here, mm -hmm. um, there is a significant disparity in the type of programming available for indigenous people. Um, there are also, thanks to your wonderful work, um, you know, hopefully moving ahead of time with the indigenous advisory group that mm -hmm. some of those, um, you know, some of those opportunities will become a little bit more equal. Mm -hmm. Um, however, I think that there needs to be Native American, Indigenous people at the leadership levels mm -hmm. within the city. Um, I examined the ideal report, which um, kind of worked to figure out what the demographics are of the city of Cambridge right. um, versus who has full-time employment here. Mm -hmm. 
and Native Americans are underrepresented in that. Um, and so are uh, Asian Americans. And so looking to those solid numbers to see where are there opportunities um, for recruitment and advancement and um, what are we missing and what is the city missing when those roles are not filled. Exactly. And just a little bit about the ideal report. The ideal report was a study, a report that was commissioned by the city of Cambridge through the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. And the idea of the report was to look at where the disparities were in the city of Cambridge, particularly as it pertained to employment. And as Sage just said, there is a hierarchy and the hierarchy does not include indigenous people, other people of color, and gave us some ideas of how to rectify that. Now, we, we had, we've had to be put for about a year and we're slowly cranking some of their recommendations out to realize what the recommendations that they were putting before us, how, what we should be doing with that. So I'm hoping that, you know, that'll speed up a little bit, but it's important, and it was important to, sh through that report, to show that what we needed to do, and it gave a bit of a historical um, aspect, where we are, why we were there, and some of the impediments, some we put, I often say sometimes we get in our own way, and what we would need to do to make those changes, and you're right, you know, what, what, what ways can we do that? Mm -hmm. Now, doc, doc, I always want to call you Dr. Lowry. Um, Please, David. Yeah. <laughs> David, what would you, kind of following up what Sage just said in terms of giving communities and people, indigenous community folk, mm -hmm. their rightful place, their, their voice being heard, what would you like to add to that? Yeah, I, um, and I think this is what Sage is sort of, uh, kind of, creating the, the frame for. Um, I believe every city in the United States, every state in the United States, um, and this gets into the federal level, there needs to be proactive indigenous American Indian presence. City Council, Boston, Cambridge. Uh, are there American Indian indigenous folks in the state legislature from Massachusetts? Um, th then it becomes more like leading up to that do we have and do we kind of create with this wealth of colonial resources do we create uh positions at, uh, for people scholars uh community advocates to be uh indigenous liaisons to really set policy that is not for really anybody else it's for indigenous people that begin to with the help of for here in cambridge the city manager whoever uh, the power holder is, begin to turn the purse towards indigenous peoples and begin uh, what I would call reparations. Mm -hmm. um, for a number of years we've had, um, and I'll, I'll be very blunt in how I say this, we've had black scholars, uh, political activists talk about reparations for African American uh, or black American folks, um, which, is, which is good and it's based in the history of shadow slavery, but shadow slavery, I mean if we were to be perfectly honest about history, shadow slavery started with the enslavement of American Indian people started here in Massachusetts, actually. So if reparations are going to be paid, if we're going to re do reparative, reparative work, mm -hmm. we have to start with the first, or shall I say, America's original sin, which is the uh, stealing of land, the enslavement of American Indian indigenous people, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of kind of legs and kind of extrapolations from what colon colonization and genocide uh, um, mean in that context. But yeah, I, we, we need to really be able to sit down as indigenous folks and be part of a collective that is permanent, that is real, and that with the help of city governments and Cambridge and, and, uh, uh, you know, and otherwise, begin to implement new types of permanent presence in leadership mm -hmm. and influence. Um, this doesn't only, pertain though to government. We have to begin to look at corporations, institutions like universities. Um, I have this really interesting piece that I'm writing um, for something else, or it's, it, I'm writing it. Uh, but it's the question, it starts with a question. The title is, what, what will happen with MIT's first indigenous president? And I believe that when you look at MIT, when you look at Harvard, um, when you look at corporations, I mean, uh, Pfizer and uh, Moderna, I think are in part based here in Cambridge. Um, what happens when the vaccine corporations have indigenous American Indian leaders as you know, CEOs? Mm -hmm. um, that will dr not just change how business is done in the United States, that will dramatically change for the better, mm -hmm. shall we say. Um, how healthcare and, um, and different types of design work take place across the United States and across the world. So like, I'm really very quickly in this conversation, I'm looking 
nationally and globally at how will the world change if the people who from the very beginning of the colony have been sentenced to die and to disappear what happens when those people who never disappeared we're still here right sage we're still yep. here <laughs> um when we begin to take on positions uh leading directing guiding and and setting policies that are unprecedented yeah oh and, and i just wanted to add to that the um when implementing some of those, uh, especially when it comes to large DEI programs, mm -hmm. um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, those are very you know hot button issues right now. Um, Robert Kraft just uh, put forth the biggest um, donation ever towards one of the area hospitals to fund a DEI um, staff person mm -hmm. indefinitely. Uh, and when we're speaking about those, we also need to remember that a lot of times Native Americans are actually left out of that conversation mm -hmm. and that we cannot do the necessary anti-racist work and then the celebrating of diversity before we tackle um, colonialism in our workplaces, in our minds, um, you know, and where we live. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's so important what you're saying about we're very good at celebrating um, groups and individuals. What's so hard for us to do, and this, when I criticize the city, I criticize myself because I'm a part of that, but how do we become more intentional, more deliberate mm -hmm. about those things around opportunity and inclusion and diversity? You know, what, what is that cliche to say, you know, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu, and we want people all of us, particularly those of us that whose land we sit on and whose land was built by free labor, we want to be a part of mm -hmm. the conversation. And, and this is why I have to celebrate you a bit, Sage. So and, and the conversation, not only was I impressed with the fact that Sage had, you know, almost a one woman, a one person show, one woman show brought this whole piece to participatory budgeting that got voted that's going to be implemented. But she also said something else as a member of the city of Cambridge and the city of Cambridge has had for a number of years diversity training. Now, some of our departments are better than others, but there is a commitment to diversity training through the city. But Sage in our conversations was saying we gloss over the indigenous population. I just want to share with folks, um, not so much the whereas, because it goes on pretty long, but the ordered. So a policy order in the city of Cambridge is the way we direct our city manager and the administration to carry out a body of work. And based on the conversation that I had had with Sage and, and, and I, know you want, I, I always want to call you professor. You still have to go do what, with it. Do whatever Thank you. you're comfortable with. Thank you, I, that helps. Um, <laughs> Professor Lowry, we sort of started brainstorming about how could we be more intentional mm -hmm. about the work that we do. You know, for me as an African American, and I think I can go and say this for, for David and Sage, we don't want to be about a party. We mm -hmm. want to be about progress and intentionality. Intentionality, and so this order basically kind of looked at. It starts with a little small historical perspective. It starts. It has been long taught as established history that the city of Newtown, which would be renamed to the city of Cambridge in 1638, was colonized by the English in 1630, and a, with a process which continues to this day. But the meat of this order is it says that it's ordered, and basically the order asks that, acknowledges some of that history that I often say needs to be rewritten. Rewrite, not rewrite to correct, but rewrite to actually change what the language is in our documents. Mm -hmm. The order says that the city formally go on record in acknowledging that the city of Cambridge occupies land that is once the home of the Massachusetts tribe, and I couldn't say the word <laughs> on the floor, uh, and I didn't want to tear it up. A vibrant and thriving community of people who were wrongfully displaced from their homeland among other indigenous people who lived here, and be it further ordered that the city council go on record acknowledging that while the modern day city of Cambridge cannot go back and undo those sins committed by our predecessors almost four centuries ago, mm. we can it must incorporate a more nuanced, more truthful telling of our historical narrative. So the first piece of that, and we've talked a little bit about how do we 
change the historical narrative. Mm. It also goes on to say that we ensure that indigenous peoples who originally occupied their land are no longer lost to history. And you make that point very clearly because in our curriculums, in our, some of our historical narratives that we currently have, we either gloss over or do not mention in a, in a real meaningful way the indigenous population. You know, more and more um, of us organizations, the city included, talk about, well, we're on, they say Massachusetts land for the most mm -hmm. part, Massachusetts land. But I think, and I can think I can say this safely, that is clearly not enough. Mm -hmm. Just to say that this is the, the land that we now own, took, and, and, and developed. The other thing that was important about this particular order, this gets to your point, Sage, it says that the city manager, because in, in Cambridge government, it's the city manager that does, actually carries out the work, is requested to review the current cultural sensitivity training for all city employees and ensure it explicitly includes, highlights the experiences of indigenous people in all cultural sensitivity training. I put out, put to you, what would, the, if you were to design that training, what would it look like? What would you think would be important to be a part of this de sensitizing, I was gonna say de sensitizing people to be more culturally aware of what's missing, what they know, what they think? Any of you want to just jump in I, on that? I, I want to say some of David's words that he spoke. Oh, please, and just say them. That, you know, that um, oftentimes, and this came up with where we were going to think about placing some of the signage, um, Native people are relegated to um, the classic savage imagery. Mm -hmm. So all of the, um, so the infrastructure uh, and the people, you know, Mm. suggesting spots where, oh, let's put it in the woods, mm. we'll put it on the side of the river, um, you know, yeah. kind of out where the natives would be. Actually, if I can, Please, before say you better. finish your point, they, they wanted to, we have, there's reservations here in, in Massachusetts. And I'm like, and I still don't understand where the term reservation comes from, if it is any way related to the reservation system that Francis Walker created in the late 1800s to house American Indian people in states of imprisonment out west and mm -hmm. down south. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sitting here and, I'm, and we're here listening to people talk historically about where these symbols and signs should go that kind of correct history. And they're saying, no, they should go with the reservation. And I'm sitting here like, no, they can't go on the reservation because not only is it symbolically weird, mm -hmm. we, like to your point, and, I would, and continue please. please, to your point, it has to be something more in your face. It has to get in the way. Uh, to quote uh, Audra Simpson, who's a famous Mohawk, if I'm not mistaken, anthropologist, we interrupt colonialism. And, and, and as Mohawk people, she says, Mohawk people interrupt colonialism just by how they choose to be present when other people don't expect them to be. Here, it, in what Sage I think is alluding to, is we have to be present as indigenous people in ways that nobody expects us to. We can't be kind of a friendly lesson on the side or one footnote in the history lesson. No, we have to be, we have to interrupt daily business. And I think I've said that mm -hmm. in our email communications this year with various people. We have to, as a native people, be allowed to disrupt, interrupt, change how money is spent. And Cambridge has a lot of money. We ha and Massachusetts has, is the Commonwealth. It's still all stolen Indian money. We have to be able to disrupt how everything takes place in terms of getting from money mm -hmm. to resources, to design, to building, taxation. This gets back into a conversation I've been having with MIT. All y'all rich folks in Massachusetts, and that's how I say it because I'm from the South. All y'all rich folks in Massachusetts have to begin paying some type of tax. Could it be a tithe? A lot of us who grew up in the church tithe. Something back to indigenous people to transfer, to reparate, to re, you know, return wealth from the colonizer to the colonized. So anyway, continue your point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so ex exactly. And I think we can apply some of these terms like trauma-informed care mm -hmm. that now social workers and educators and um, you know leaders are really using to uh, review what they had thought that they were taught and what aspects of the story are missing. Mm. And so I think, well, first and foremost, uh, as a project, needs to be indigenous-led. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And indigenous people are not a monolith. Mm -hmm. right. um, 
in some of the um, publications and documents of the city, and you can see us also using the words interchangeably, uh, Native American, indigenous person, mm -hmm. um, American, you know, so it can be very confusing. Um, and that also leads to um, people kind of saying, well, it's too confusing, or let's just push them in with other people of color. Mm -hmm. um, so in you know some of those reports, um, I have, we were American Indian, Amer Indian, AK Native, Alaska mm -hmm. Native, other, and people of color. Mm -hmm. So when mm -hmm. there are six different terms being used across these data points, it becomes very difficult for even people who study data mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. understand these, never mind mm -hmm. for um, you know, people who are just trying, starting to take that next step into you know, realizing that what you're taught wasn't correct. And that's, that's shaky, that, that can shake someone to their core. Yes. You know, learning that Columbus didn't actually discover America is something that a lot of people still don't want to reconcile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's a lot of work. And can I follow that up? Please. I believe uh, this gets into when I was a student, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, tenth grade, whatever, in high school, middle school, high school, I used to read current events because they were required. And I'm assuming teachers still do that here mm -hmm. in Cambridge and mm -hmm. Massachusetts mm -hmm. in general. Mm -hmm. What does it mean when a child reads an article written by a local news station, which I literally just read one a week ago, where they're talking about housing, the housing crisis in Boston and Cambridge and Massachusetts, and they describe people as white, black, and brown people. My, and I tweeted at the person who wrote, I won't say who they are, but I said, you know, if I'm a child reading this, I am groomed to think by you that there's only white, black, and brown people. Brown people is not a category that the CDC uses to analyze health across the United States. Uh, the dem demographers who take the census, what, every 10 years do not use brown people as a category. But for some reason, journalists and I think teachers and I think people who educate in some mm -hmm. context use brown, use these kind of ambiguous, it used to be a mulatto back in the day, 100 years ago. It used to be, you mixed. know, all mixed. Mm -hmm. Now it's brown. Or, and it's always, it's this perpetual need mm -hmm. to place a non-specific, ambiguous category around people who, shall we say it, through his, the history of policies in the United States have been purposed for disappearing, have been purposed for death. Mm -hmm. yeah. So to your point, and I believe this is a lesson that should be learned by all politicians, perhaps in the room and who are watching, don't be non-specific when there are specifics that you just don't know. Don't be ambiguous just because you can be, because lack of clarity, lack of precision is getting us in trouble, not just in terms of colonization, but in terms of humanity in general. Like lack of specificity, lack of precision with our language, and I say this as an anthropologist, is, is biting us in the butt. Um, that it's really problematic. So anyway, to your point, I, I don't know if I cut you off. I'm, no. I so you were saying? No, I mean, that's, it's just a, a great way to, um, you know, to come together all of the different issues that, I mean, we indigenous people weren't even included into the censuses before right. mulatto, mulatto people were included before indigenous Absolutely. people were. Mm -hmm. And that has actually led to quite a few of the larger federal issues that we see with um, tribalization and who gets to claim mm -hmm. being a native or not. Mm -hmm. And um, when those documents had been used, but someone was either there race was either left off or changed by the person or just guessed, mm -hmm. um, or that it wasn't as available as a category. There mm -hmm. wasn't even other available as the category. Mm -hmm. um, or, and this is the case down south, every native was called Cherokee. Now Cherokee people come up to all these natives who haven't gotten recognition by the federal government as native people. You've claimed to be us, and we're like, we didn't do it. It was the federal government who claimed that we were you. Mm -hmm. They used your name to basically wipe out hundreds of American Indian nations. So now, and uh, you know, we heard it recently, I won't say where, you know, there's still people coming out saying, yeah, my grandmother is part Cherokee, or I have a Cherokee princess. That is based in some type of reality. The reality is not 
who your grandmother is oftentimes. Mm -hmm. It's in categorization of American Indian people through one lens, and that was Cherokee historically. Again, this gets very deep. It is you know, a very mm -hmm. anthropological, broad conversation. But again, it's about how the United States and all of the intelligence that we think we hold, we've been purposely redirected, pushed mm -hmm. to the side. Uh, things have become purposely mixed up and obscured and made invisible. And we have to purposely work ourselves out of that obscurity. Yeah. And we see that, I mean, we see that the results of those mixed messages mm -hmm. in federal reporting in the documents that I just stated where natives are six different types of categories, even in 2021's um, reporting through Cambridge. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's a significant information, and I think it goes back to what you were saying about if we're going to have these cultural sensitivity trainings, it should be, I think, you know, um, I don't make all the rules, but I sometimes influence them a bit, should have the people that know the subject, the people that we're trying to do the sensitivity training around for about should be the people that lead it. And I don't think we do enough of it. I think we think about it mm -hmm. uh, as a city. but we don't dig down as, as deep as we could. And just speaking specifically, um, some of the times when we have trainings, uh, we'll get people that do not represent the group that we're talking about, as you said, to talk about it. And then you kind of wince a little bit when they misspeak or, mm. or um, not intentionally tell untruths, but they just don't know. Mm. And so I certainly would agree, and I'm hoping as this moves forward through the city in particular, because I think the city has its own responsibility to do its own work, um, will be very intentional about who stands at the top mm. of the room. There's another piece in this uh, order that I want to share with you, and it says that the city manager being is here, I requested to convene an advisory group to determine ways in which the city can work to lift up voices and experiences of the descendants of indigenous people. If you were to appoint that advisory, mm. what would it look like? I mean, I think that it would be probably um, at least made of half, half of the advisory group should be residents of Cambridge that mm. are Native American. And then the other half would be from the surrounding um, towns mm -hmm. because there needs to be an acknowledgement mm -hmm. that these lines that are artificial and created, um, they were created not for the purpose of uplifting Native Americans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes uh, leadership uses those as an excuse to not share information. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be, um, you know, really valuable to get some of the knowledge that is being kept at the universities mm -hmm. um, to, you know, really become something different and mm -hmm. um, so that indigenous people can regain some of the uh, narratives around um, who holds our stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if I can follow up on that, I think uh, Cambridge is in large part Harvard. <laughs> you know, Harvard's uh, presence here became what Cambridge is today. It kind of, and still, I mean, the argument when we were moving back into this area a little over a year ago mm -hmm. was that, you know, Harvard's taking over everything. They're, you know, inching into Boston. But but if you look, you know, in a more recent history, into deeper history, Harvard really became the anchor for what became Cambridge today. Mm -hmm. um, MIT more recently has put its roots down, its colonial roots down, um, and both institutions are like bookends to Cambridge. So this, this commission, this committee, this kind of advisory, advisory. board mm -hmm. needs to, and really, and, and I've heard from various people who have been in political offices in and around Cambridge and Boston, they've tried to reach into Harvard, tried to reach into MIT, and try to have uh, good-hearted, progressive conversations about how to bring in, uh, justice to indigenous folks. Uh, and you know, in both universities, by and large, have kind of closed the door, if not hard, maybe a little easy, but, but closed the door and really didn't invite folks in, I think this type of committee, advisory board, uh, advisory com um, sort of whatever entity mm -hmm. would really be empowered by saying, listen, this is a new age of, of reparations of justice. 
given what Harvard is going through right now, given what MIT is and has sort of been going through over the last couple decades uh, in terms of correcting some of its role in the history of, of genocide, um, we need to really bring both institutions in to, to be at the table, not as leaders necessarily, but as partners in the conversation. Because quite honestly, this past year at MIT, American Indian students, when I asked them point blank, do you want MIT to exist? Should it just go away? Native students were like, well, of course not. MIT has a lot to offer. And I think people would say the same thing about Harvard University. Uh, but the point is not to, in some way, kind of glowingly celebrate those two institutions. It's really to say, hey, they're partners in this conversation. Mm -hmm. Political, social, uh, perhaps metaphysical and spiritual partners in correcting and resolving and, and setting a new course. I think you're absolutely, absolutely right. How do we have those conversations as equals? not mm -hmm. as you know, mm -hmm. one better than the other. And that's, that's an important first step, and I hope as we move forward that that comes to be. But let's spice it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. We live at a time when, we, when so much consequence is happening almost on a daily basis. The January 6th committee, if those of you that were tuning in to, to that live drama, is drawing attention to the fact that a uh, former president sought to violently overturn the will of the people during the last election. One of our two major political parties is seeking to cast doubt on the legitimacy mm -hmm. of future election. The war in Ukraine threatens to expand and, and draw the United States into a wider conflict with Russia. Increasing inflation is impacting people in their wallets. Where does this work, this, this work of, of reparations and parity, where does this work fit into the broader context? Mm -hmm. You can say that. <laughs> Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I'll give you a story, and I always like to ground myself in store or ground the larger conversation in stories. I was with my nephew, came to visit this past year. We went to Harvard. This was after Russia began, began invading Ukraine. And uh, Harvard, above John Harvard's statue, Harvard hung a Ukrainian flag. And my nephew, who's Lumbee, very aware, very smart, but quiet, he said, mm -hmm. Uncle, that's what he calls me. Yes, Micah. Um, I have a question. Uh, the, he says, I, this is confusing to me. I'm like, okay, get it out. He says, why do they hang a Ukrainian flag, but they don't hang a tribal flag? Why don't they hold, hang the flags of the native people? Where are the native people at? And, like he started asking these questions. Mm -hmm. And I was stuck there. I was like, whoa. You know, Harvard tends not to change the kind of aesthetic of their campus. For them to put up a Ukrainian flag above John Harvard or near him was really interesting. But my nephew, having never gone to Harvard before, he caught it in that moment. He's mm -hmm. like, wait a minute. If there's going to be flags here, there should be more flags than this. So I, I kind of back up from that, right? And I'm realizing that you know, domestic versus international, you know, us versus the world, some world power such as Russia. Uh, within the United States, Democrats versus Republicans, it's easy for us to get caught up mm -hmm. in these political binaries. But I often tell, times tell people as we're looking at uh, new uh, Supreme Court justices being invited to come in to make a very diverse Supreme Court you know, set of justices, neither Democrat nor Republican presidents have invited American Indian judges to be on the Supreme Court. Why do we not have an American Indian, Native American, Indigenous justice on the Supreme Court. And then when you zoom out and look at the entire federal government, I think we have Deb Holland, who uh, Biden has you know, mm -hmm. set up as the Depart or, uh, Secretary of the Interior at this, right. at this point. A lot of praise coming from Native America. Yes, this is great, but at the same time, as an anthropologist who studies race and kind of the political dynamics of the United States, I say it would have been probably more important, more influential, more kind of uh, um, uh, paradigm shifting if he would have invited an American Indian person to be on the Supreme Court because after he's gone, Deb Holland's gone probably mm -hmm. uh, from her office. But once you esta establish or place a native person or any person in a Supreme Court justice seat, that's permanent. And I and I don't use the Supreme Court as like the only place of a, for a conversation. I believe, again, zooming out, we have to realize that the politics of the United States, whether you're on one side or the other of particular political debates or, or kind of ideologies, um, uh, ideologies sort of juxtapositions, you, we have to realize that in the course of all of these conversations, Native people, American Indian people, Indigenous people continue to get left out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's why you don't see us really on the political stages of either political party mm -hmm. when it comes to, uh, l let's watch, what is it, 2024. Let's, find, let's watch to see which political party invites us Native folks to the stage. I, I'll be surprised mm -hmm. if we actually show up in a really you know, formidable way. Highly doubt it, 
but I'll be surprised that it'll happen. But I'm, uh, it'll be nice if we do, if we do show up. Um, but I, I think the noise of the politics right now, as we kind of say, oh, everybody is against something or, or everybody's asking for something to change. Since 1492 and since, uh, when was Cambridge founded again? 1635. 35? Don't get us to lie yeah. Kevin? on Four, camera, but in the 1600s. 400 years ago, mm -hmm. right? Um, since 400 years ago, American Indian people have persistently, through different types of American politics, uh, there used to be Whigs. Do we have Whigs anymore? No. Um, that was a political party, right? I think so, if I'm remembering <laughs> history right. But, but through different political types and, and kind of ideologies, Native people persistently have been left out of positions of influence and authority and, and ownership. And we have to, in this moment, not be caught up in the current sort of 20 or 40 years of politics. We need to think historically very deeply 400 years back to what we have, not we, what the colony has stolen from us American Indian people and what we collectively as 600 plus American Indian nations mm -hmm. want back. So. Yeah, and I think- Want to add something? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think it comes down to greed. Uh, at the at the global scale, mm -hmm. um, and one uh, way that greed has been used uh, legally and has been um, justified with religion is through the doctrine of discovery, mm -hmm. the belief that you uh, that as a colonizer, as someone who is following a certain religion, if you go to a new space and the pr people who are living there don't follow that religion that you have the right to convert, and if they don't do that, they can take their land. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when you look at, you know, be part of what who we are, or you can't exist, mm -hmm. that's exactly what's happening in um, between Ukraine and Russia. Mm -hmm. um, when speaking to in South America, um, many of the indigenous tribes in the rainforests are the protectors and the keepers of those lands. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the, um, you know, what has caused a lot of the environmental issues that across the world that deeply impact um, famine, mm -hmm. that deeply impact, uh, you know, weather phenomena mm -hmm. and um, climate change, those are all the results of greed and imperialism that has been um, given the okay by either you know dictators whether they come on the political side or the religious side um, and it's time for it to end mm -hmm. if, if i can jump on that sure. uh, and that's brilliant i'm glad you brought up the um, doctrine of discovery boston is a hub for the catholic church right some of you probably are catholics in the room and, and watching S Speak back to the Catholic Church because, you know, in many ways, the doctrine of discovery, which came directly out of, I think it was Pope Nicholas, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you know, before Columbus ever made it over to the New World, uh, I think it was like 1435. That edict, that, that permission that was given to the doctrine of discovery came straight into the United States, played havoc between Spain and England and France, and they had wars and they brought Native people in. So Native people from the very beginning were caught up in that kind of fight for imperialistic domination. But once the United States was established, the Supreme Court early in American history basically said, hey, that permission that we had from Europe to take over the land, it's transferred from Europe over to the United States. And that was the magic, the, the brilliance of the doctrine of discovery because now you have the highest court, and this is why I always say we need native people on the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court of the United States uses the doctrine of discovery from like 1435 Currently, as it looks out at different American Indian communities, I think recently there was decisions in Oklahoma basically taking away sovereignty from American Indian nations there and saying, no, 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 no. We as the, uh, what one justice called the Court of the Conqueror, we're looking at you over there in Oklahoma and we're gonna say, eh, you don't have any, as many rights as you claim. And Native people are saying, you never gave us the rights. We had the rights before you even got here. So there's mm -hmm. no way you can give them or take them away. So these are the types of conversations that are really important. I believe it should start here in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. I believe it should start here more generally in Massachusetts. And if it starts here, if we have these conversations here, right here, right now, in a very open, honest, um, shall we say collective community way, uh, it will have an impact and, and put place pressure on the rest of the United States. And you've brought us to a great place. It doesn't seem like we've been talking an hour. 
what we have. And I just want to say it's been an extraordinary conversation. If I've learned anything, I've learned that we have to do it again. Because you're right, it should start here. This is, I often think of and call Cambridge America's classroom. If anyone should, I'm not going to say can, but should get it right, we certainly should get it right. So I just want to say thank you. And before I just close this out, is there anything that you wanted to mention, something we didn't touch upon that you want to say before we close ourselves out? Either of you. I think that um, if Cambridge wants to put uh, Native people first, then they need to disinvest from Harvard until the remains of the 7,000 plus indigenous people that are held there um, are returned to their original spaces um, because that's 1,972% more people, dead native people, dead bodies are in Harvard than there are currently living in Cambridge. And we'll never have the representation if there's more uh, in the crypt than, you know, on the streets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. David? Um, as we were talking, I was thinking about the political center of Native people in Boston is NACOP, the Native North American Indian Center of Boston. It's mm -hmm. in Jamaica Plain. Um, if you go by the building, it has holes all in the side of the building. Uh, the building is really not up to standard, up to what we would live in and, and socialize in. The pressure that we should feel in this conversation isn't just this kind of intellectual political pressure. We have a, these are our neighbors. NACOB, the people who use NACOB, they're our neighbors. There should be pressure. There should be um, um, voices coming out of Cambridge going towards the people who are in charge at the Boston and Boston uh, at the state of Massachusetts level, looking back at them or having them look back at NACOB and say, is this how you think about, or this is this how you value, is this sort of, how, yeah, is this how you value American Indian, Native American people at this point? Uh, because, you know, there's new leadership and there's l old leaders who've been here for a while who can do better. And I think we collectively, Native and non-Native people, should put pressure on government entities to look at a place like NACOP and say, listen, this is the place where our American Indian, Native American community calls home. We should upgrade it, build it, build it better, and it should be for Native communities to be, to feel in the kind of physical world, but also in that kind of intellectual metaphysical world that they belong and that people here care for them. Uh, care isn't a, can't be an assumed thing. It's part of budgets, and mm -hmm. I believe there was a fancy yeah. statement that budgets are like moral documents. Is that how it goes? You know, if, if we're not budgeted in, if resources aren't placed immediately into creating opportunities and places for us as American Indian people, um, we don't matter. And the irony for the North American Indian Center of Boston is that it's a former women's prison. Yes. So that's yeah. where yeah. that's where we go. Yeah. So. You know, I can't thank you thank enough you. for giving your time, your talent to this conversation. One of the things I do know that we've just started so we're on the road, we're not there yet. So I look forward to having a conversation with you more about this, about indigenous people, about what we can do to right the, the past wrongs. And I wanna thank each of you for joining us this evening or this afternoon, or when you may tune into this a conversation. This is, many of, this is one of many conversations that the museum is going to be uh, hosting. And so I hope that you will go to our website to learn more about what about our work, to view this, to share this, the link when you watch it with your friends, and uh, make sure that you take this opportunity to kind of really let this information in. Think about your place, your role, what you can do to make things different, because together we can make a change. Thanks for watching.